<laughs> well, in the Neil Simon play and movie uh, Barefoot in the Park, a newly married couple comes home to their small apartment, excited to start their new life together. Uh, Paul and Corey, they flirt, they laugh, uh, they dream, and they argue a lot. Uh, what do they argue about? Well, many things, uh, but specifically about walking barefoot in the park. Uh, Corey invited Paul to walk barefoot in Central Park once, and, and Paul refused, citing cold temperatures. Uh, Corey has never let it go. The issue becomes a proxy battle for massive personality differences. Uh, soon enough, their relationship seems to unravel, and Paul is sleeping on the couch, and Corey is threatening divorce. Now, spoiler alert, they work it out. But uh, the play is about how marriage can be a challenge for even the happiest couples. When you throw two people together into a committed, lifelong relationship, it is never a walk in the park. Uh, soon enough, even the most well-meaning people, frustrated by matrimony, are looking for ways to end it. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning. I want to talk about marriage and divorce. Uh, marriage is a great thing. I've been happily married for, for 26 years. Uh, some of those years have been the best years of my life. <laughs> but uh, marriage is hard. Uh, people have been looking to get out of marriages as long as people have been getting married. This does raise the question, though, is divorce okay? What does God think about that, for those of us who care? Uh, when might divorce be okay? When might it not be? Is not walking barefoot in the park a good reason to get divorced? And more positively, how, how do we do marriage in a way that prevents divorce from ever happening? Uh, these are good questions, relevant questions that if you're married, you have dealt with, or you might deal with, or if you have a friend who's married, you, you might deal with. There are also questions that, that Jesus actually has some things to, to say about. Uh, we've been studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount here at Rooftop in our current series called Religion Redefined. And the Sermon on the Mount, if you don't know, it's this big sermon that Jesus preaches. It's recorded in Matthew 5 through 7. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, sort of lays out, it's his manifesto on God's very high expectations for his people. And Jesus talks a lot of, about a lot of different things in the sermon, uh, different topics, including marriage and divorce. The people of Jesus' day had as many problems with, in general, but with marriage and divorce as we do. So Jesus talks about it. Now his words are sparse. And as we read them, we might think a couple things. We might think, this is really hard. And we might also wonder if what Jesus has to say is even helpful. But if we listen really deeply to, to what Jesus is saying, I think we're going to find that God gives us a vision of marriage that is worth fighting for, no matter how many barefoot walks in the park we have to take. So let me go ahead and share with you what Jesus says. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 through 32. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must provide her with a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness, sexual immorality, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's it. <laughs> That's what Jesus has to say about marriage and divorce. <laughs> At least here. It is short, it is difficult, and it is perplexing. What's Jesus saying? And, and how is this helpful? Well, I think Jesus' words here are actually really important and really helpful for those of us who are married or might get married or are friends who are married, but it's going to take us some work to, to figure out how. So first, let's pull back and remind ourselves of the context in which Jesus is teaching this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. In this section of the sermon, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees' tendency to interpret the Old Testament law in ways that make it easy to obey. So remember that the Jews were people of the law. They were very proud of the law that God had given them. The only problem is that many of them had interpreted the Hebrew law in such a way that they were missing the point. They were lowering the bar. They were basically lowering the bar in order to maintain their righteousness without having to jump too high. 
So for example, the law says, you know, do not murder. And they're like, oh, okay, well, as long as we don't murder anybody, we can like think whatever we want about them in our hearts. We can even call them names. And as long as we don't, you know, kill them, we're good. Jesus says, no, that's not the point. God gives you the law so that you can see into his heart and learn what he really wants. It's, it's not enough to not murder someone. You, you have to love them in your heart the way God loves them. You have to see them as a brother or a sister. Uh, you, you have to pursue reconciliation with them. Jesus does this with lust and with anger and with oaths. And that's what's happening in this passage, too. The Pharisees were lowering the bar of marriage and divorce. You see, the Old Testament law actually included rules on divorce. In a passage in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses gives some rules to men who divorce their spouses. Here's what Moses says. Moses says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. Okay, so that's the Old Testament law on divorce. Frankly, that's kind of weird. What it says is that if a man finds something indecent about his wife and gives her a certificate of divorce, and if that woman marries another man who also divorces her, or if he dies, then that woman's first husband can't marry her again. It doesn't say explicitly why, it just says that he can't. That's the law that Jesus is quoting, and the law that the Pharisees are misinterpreting. Now, how are they misinterpreting it? Well, it comes down to those phrases, certificate of divorce for something indecent. You see, here's what was happening. The Pharisees believed that the Hebrew Bible gave them permission to get divorces. If they found something indecent in their spouse, they just had to provide a certificate of divorce, and that's what the law seemed to say. Now, what does it mean to find something indecent? Does it mean to, you know, like, find some lingerie in your wife's underwear drawer? Oh, that's indecent. I mean, most men don't think of divorce when they find that. <laughs> well, this is where the debate took place. Uh, some Jewish scholars thought that indecent meant imperfect. Uh, like if the man discovers his wife has a deformity or a blemish. Uh, some people thought that indecent meant morally compromised. Like if the woman had an affair. Uh, but honestly, the law is so vague that scholars came up with all kinds of possible ways that a wife could be indecent. Uh, one Jewish school of thought actually held that if a wife burns the man, burned a man's toast, it was grounds for divorce. That's actually written in a Jewish law somewhere. So that's how the Pharisees were interpreting the law. Now, before we get too far, it's easy to judge them for their low standards, right? But you know we do the same thing. I mean, in our culture, you don't even have to provide that much justification to get divorced. You can just cite irreconcilable differences. Uh, you can say, well, you know, we're moving in two different directions. Toast doesn't need to even factor into the equation. So how does Jesus respond to their low standards and to ours? Well, he does what he's been doing. He raises the bar. The Pharisees were lowering the bar, and Jesus pushes it right back up. Here's what Jesus says. He says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for adultery or sexual immorality, which is the, the actual phrase, uh, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay. How is Jesus raising the bar? He says that you think you can get divorced just by getting a certificate for finding something indecent. That's a low bar. But I say that if you divorce your wife, except, except for sexual immorality, you cause her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries your ex-wife commits adultery. That's what Jesus says. Now, what? How does that make sense? Well, let me explain. Let me explain. First, remember that Jesus is talking primarily to men. Why? Because... That's just how it was back then. It was a patriarchal culture. Jesus tells husbands that if they divorce their wives, their wives become adulteresses. 
You see, it was very rare for a woman to be unmarried back then. If a woman was unmarried, she had no means to provide for herself. She needed to get married or remarried just for the economic stability. So if a man divorces his wife, that woman would have to get remarried. But once she gets remarried, what is she? According to Jesus, what is she? An adulteress. Why? Because despite the fact that her husband gave her a certificate of divorce, she's still married to him. So even though he divorced her with a certificate, she's still married and becomes an adulteress when she marries another man, as she has to in that culture. Jesus goes on, though. He says that if another man marries a divorced woman, that man also becomes an adulterer. Why? Because he's having a relationship with a divorced woman who Jesus says is actually still married to her first husband despite the divorce. What Jesus seems to be saying here, what he seems to be saying here, is that marriage is permanent. To use a fancy schmancy word, marriage is indissoluble. You can't dissolve it in God's eyes. So even if you divorce your spouse, spouse with a certificate based on some indecency, like toast burning, you're still married. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. Talk about raising the bar. The Pharisees said you could divorce for lots of reasons, and Jesus says you can't get divorced for any reason. Well, any reason except one. Let's talk about that little phrase. What's the phrase? Except for sexual immorality. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality causes her to become an adulteress. Maybe you picked up on this. It's commonly referred to as the exception clause. Biblical theologians have phrases for everything. This is called the exception clause. The way the exception clause is frequently read is that Jesus' teaching on the indissolubility of marriage has one exception. So marriage is permanent except when it is broken by an affair or by any act of sexual immorality. The Greek word used here is actually uh, porneia, and it means sexual immorality or fornication or adultery. So marriage is permanent unless someone has committed sexual immorality of some kind, an affair, a porn addiction, sexual abuse. That's how the, the exception clause is frequently read. And I've actually run into this several times over the years. Uh, when couples come to me to talk about their marriage problems, for example, and whether or not they can or should stay together, frequently one of them has committed adultery, and the other one says, well, this means I can get a divorce, right? Jesus says in this circumstance I can get a divorce, right? Right, Pastor Matt? I can get a divorce, right? So what do we make of the exception clause? There's actually a couple problems with the traditional interpretation of the exception clause. First, is this the only exception? Is that the only reason that Jesus says couples can get divorced? That seems limited. What about abuse? What about abandonment? Those aren't good enough exceptions for Jesus to include? That seems unfair. The other problem with the interpretation, this interpretation of the exception clause is that in other parallel passages in the Bible, there is no exception clause. Uh, remember, there are how many Gospels in the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them remember the teachings of Jesus in a slightly different way. And in other Gospels, Jesus doesn't give any exception clause at all. Uh, like in Luke. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. No exceptions. Or in Mark, the other passage. So in Matthew, Jesus says that marriage is permanent and divorce is wrong, except if there is sexual immorality. But in Mark and Luke, Jesus says that marriage is permanent, divorce is wrong, period. Okay. Now we have two questions. The first question, what do we do with the exception clause? And the second question, what do we do with Jesus' teaching in general? Marriage is permanent? Like you can't get divorced? Ever? Ever, 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 ever? Well, let's talk about the exception clause first, and then we'll talk about Jesus' point. 
I actually think the explanation to the exception clause is, is fairly simple. And it has to do with understanding who Matthew is as a writer. Matthew is a little bit different from the other gospel writers. He is very specific, and he's a very good teacher. He aims for clarity. And here's the rub. I don't think Jesus in Matthew is giving an exception clause. In fact, I don't think there's any exceptions at all. Uh, one of my seminary professors pointed this out to me years ago. He, he said Jesus is probably, probably, and we can be humble here, but Jesus is probably just being clear about who causes someone to be called an adulterer. I mean, let me give you an example. Let's say I am married to Michelle, which I am. Yeah, here's a picture from like 1984. <laughs> Let's say that Michelle develops an intimate and indecent relationship with our mailman. <laughs> That's Cheaty from The Good Place, in case you're wondering. Sexy mailman. And let's say I found out, find out about this. And let's say that I secure a certificate of divorce for this indecency. Oh, that's sad. This just doesn't look right. <laughs> and let's say that Michelle goes ahead and consummates and marries the mailman out of economic necessity. <laughs> J Jesus says, that doesn't look right either, right? <laughs> Jesus says that my action of divorcing her has caused her to become an adulteress by marrying someone else while still being married to me. But, wait a second. She already committed adultery with the mailman. So is it my act of divorcing her that causes her to become an adulteress, or is it her act of adultery with the mailman? You see, it's not an exception clause. Jesus is just being clear. He's saying that if you divorce your spouse and then marry another, they're committing adultery because they're still married to you unless they've actually committed adultery. In that case, it's not you making them an adulteress, but their own adultery making them an adulteress. In Matthew, Jesus is just being clear. He's offering a note of clarity where Mark and Luke don't. But interestingly, what do we do with this? We see this supposed exception clause, and we interpret it as a loophole. Like the Pharisees. We're always looking for loopholes. We're always looking to lower the bar. We think, oh, here's a way I can justify my divorce. One of us committed adultery, or has a porn addiction, or this or that. But it's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't giving exceptions. In fact, the idea that Jesus would be giving exceptions undermines his entire point, which brings us back to his entire point. What is Jesus' entire point? Well, like I said, Jesus' entire point seems to be that marriage is permanent no matter what. Now, is he saying that? If he is, yikes! That's tough! Jesus' disciples even knew it was tough. Uh, in fact, in one of those parallel passages about marriage, after Jesus shared this teaching for the disciples, uh, and Jesus was very critical of divorce, do you know what Jesus' disciples said? They said this. They said, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I mean, if Jesus is saying that once you're married, you're married in God's eyes forever on earth, no matter what, then I kind of agree with the disciples. Do not get on that boat. You're cutting off your only life raft. I mean, if you're on the boat forever, if you're not going to be on the, stuck on the boat forever, don't get on the boat. And that's what the disciples are like, oh, it's better not to marry. But is Jesus saying that? Well, at this point, we need to remember something important. We need to remember how Jesus teaches. And we found this in the Sermon on the Mount already. When Jesus teaches, he uses a lot of hyperbole, exaggeration, to make his points. And we've already seen this in the Sermon on the Mount. How? Well, he said that if you are angry with your brother, you're going to be judged before God in hell as though you had killed him. Really? Really? He said that if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her. He said that you should not even resist an evil person. These are hyperbolic statements that we should not take literally. 
They are not intended to be taken literally. I mean, if we do take the, them literally, if we do take the Sermon on the Mount literally, guess what? We should all be cutting off our hands and gouging out our eyes. No, we shouldn't take these statements literally, but we should take them seriously. And there's a difference. We shouldn't take them literally, but we should take them seriously. Now, how do we take this literally, but not literally, but seriously? We take it seriously by tapping into the spirit of what Jesus is saying. What's he saying? Jesus isn't saying that marriage is permanent. He's saying that marriage should be. That's what Jesus is saying. Not that marriage is permanent, but that marriage should be. Now, how do we know that this is what Jesus is saying? Because in a parallel passage, he actually just says that. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is having a debate with the Pharisees about marriage and divorce. Here's how it goes. The Pharisees say, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. That's from Deuteronomy. Jesus replied, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man, one separate. Basically, Jesus says that God allowed for divorce in the Old Testament because your hearts were hard. God allowed for divorce because he knew it was going to happen. I mean, divorce happens. It just does. Marriage takes two willing parties, and if you don't have that, you're not going to have a marriage for very long. I've met with couples and can sometimes tell, this is just not going to happen. I mean, aside from the miraculous, uninvited uh, intervention of God, there's just no way this is going to work out. God is a realist, even more of a realist than me. As a realist, God accommodated the law to marital realities. He said, if you're going to get divorced, here's how you do it. Write up a certificate so that you can prove you're divorced. At the very least, you're going to need the paperwork. So the law accounts for divorce in a very humane way. But just because the law allowed for divorce doesn't mean it's what God intended or desires, and this is what the Pharisees were forgetting. And this is what Jesus came to reassert. He is clarifying that just because God allowed for divorce doesn't mean we should get one. That wasn't the plan. That isn't the plan. What's the plan? The plan is that marriage be a fulfilling relationship between two willing people, one that nothing tears apart. God desires that marriage be a permanent, productive, earthly bond between a man and a woman who serve each other lovingly all their days. Honestly, I don't know too many married people who don't desire that. I mean, I don't, I don't marry a lot of people who are expecting to get divorced. Most people who get married want to stay happily married forever. I mean, that's the dream, right? To die in your old age with your spouse in bed, by your side, holding hands at the same time. See you, Mabel. Been a good 50 years. Then you wake up in heaven with your spouse. Mabel! That's the dream. But we also know that the dream of lifelong marriages is increasingly rare. Uh, in his book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, which I think is an excellent book, uh, author and marriage expert Dr. John Gottman points out that the chance of a marriage ending in divorce over a 40-year period is 67%. So nearly 7 in 10 marriages not interrupted by death will end before the couple's 40th anniversary, 7 out of 10. Uh, the average length of a marriage in the United States these days is 8.2 years. Far short of lifelong. These days, most marriages don't last. We know this. But however comfortable in our culture that we've gotten with divorce, we also know in our hearts that that's just not the idea. Marriage was intended to be something more. We, we know that. We feel that. So the real question isn't what God desires here. Most every married person desires that. The real question is, how do we get there? If Jesus' point is that marriage should be permanent, how do we make it so? How do we build marriages that last? That is an entirely separate sermon. I have a lot to say about it. I'm going to run out of time, so let me just cram some things in 
Over the years, I've actually learned a lot about how to build a happy and lasting marriage. I've learned a lot mostly from, from meeting and talking with people, but also learning from my own mistakes. As a very imperfect husband, married to a slightly less imperfect wife. That means slightly more perfect for those of you who couldn't follow the double negative there. Uh, like I said, Michelle and I have been married for 26 years. We have achieved unity and shared purpose. We have grown together. We have suffered together. We have served together, served together. And even after 26 years, we are still excited about what God has in store for us to experience together. But it has not been easy. We have been to three separate marriage counselors, and I share that with you with her permission. We have read books, and we have had lots of awkward conversations about conflicts and my feelings and walking barefoot in parks or our, our version of that argument. Now, we, we try to have those conversations early uh, so they don't spiral into bigger conflicts that we can't control. And that's actually one of the key elements to building a lasting, healthy marriage. Get help early before you think you need it. In fact, uh, this is going to bum you out. Ready? The sad reality is that most marriage counseling is ineffective. In his book, Gottman points out that only 18% of couples in marriage counseling report benefit from the counseling. And in half of those cases, the benefit disappears within a year. The, the problem with most marriage counseling is that it happens too late. One partner has usually checked out. Now, that does not mean that marriage counseling doesn't work. It just means that if you have things to work on, you have to work on them earlier than you think you do. So there are lots of things to talk about when it comes to marriage, but you don't need my advice. Trust me, you'll, you'll just end up in marriage counseling, which, you know, 18%. What you need here is God's advice. I mean, he's the one who came up with the institution. So what is God's advice? Well, that's the thing. Jesus doesn't give us a lot of advice here. He just says that marriage should be permanent. Deal with it. Jesus, I'm not sure if that's very helpful. Thank you. On the other hand, it, it is helpful to be reminded of what God's vision for marriage is and how much of a tragedy divorce is in his mind. I mean, if you've ever been in a marriage pickle and you're praying desperately wondering, what is God's will for you? Jesus tells us. What is God's will? His will is that you and your spouse find a way to stick it out for his glory and your good. That's his will. That's his dream. Now, whether or not that will happen will take two willing people. That's the dream. Don't forget about the dream. On the other hand, I think that elsewhere Jesus is actually quite helpful when it comes to marriage. And this is what I want to leave you with before we close with communion. You see, what are the two most important things that Jesus gives his people to do here on earth? What are the two most important commands that Jesus gives us to do? Love God, love others. Those are the two great commandments. Jesus boiled down all the law, laws about food, about clothes, about worship, about marriage even, to two commands. As he says in Matthew, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, spouse as yourself. All the law, all the prophets hang on these two commands. Now, what do these two commands have to do with marriage? Dare I say everything. Take the first one. Uh, love God with every part of who you are. The first key to building a healthy, long-lasting marriage is for you as an individual to put God at the center of your life. Not to put God at the center of your spouse's life. Put God at the center of every part of your life. You cannot control who your spouse is going to worship. You cannot control how much your spouse loves God. You cannot control your spouse's emotional or physical or spiritual health. You can control who you worship. You can control how devoted you are to God's will for your life. You can control how healthy you are. If you want to give your marriage a chance, love God with every part of who you are. I mean, you're going to need him, right? You're going to need his wisdom. You're going to need his strength. You're going to need his presence. Here's the reality. The reality is that you need God more than your spouse. You need God more than your spouse. You know you're not even going to be married in heaven, right? Did you know that? Did you know you're not going to be married in heaven? Jesus says that. 
It actually says that. So marriage is an earthly institution. In heaven, you're not going to need it because everyone's going to be so in love with God. A lot of people don't know that. In fact, both my grandmas died, and they both died, like, longing to see their husbands again. I'm like, Grandma, sorry, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I didn't tell that to them on their deathbed. But marriage is an earthly institution. Now, that's either liberating or sad, right? It kind of depends on your marriage. Uh, Michelle and I are a little bummed out by it. Uh, we like our space, you know, but uh, we like being married. We've been doing this for a long time. Marriage is kind of normal for us. So we've actually, Michelle and I, we've made plans to hang out in heaven, grab some coffee, catch up, check in on each other. How you doing? How are the kids? Have you seen them? I don't know. I hope they're here. <laughs> are you still a nurse? No, no sick people. <laughs> still a pastor? No. Jesus took over. <laughs> My point is that the best chance you have at a lasting, healthy marriage is to put God ahead of your spouse. You need God more than your spouse. If you each as individuals put God ahead of your marriage, here's the counterintuitive irony. If you put God ahead of your marriage, he will bless your marriage. If you put God ahead of your marriage, he will bless your marriage. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean to put God ahead of your marriage? Well, if your spouse doesn't want to come to church, guess what you do? That's head on down to church. Rachel's got it. If your spouse doesn't want to get help from a pastor, guess what you do? You get help from a pastor. If your spouse doesn't want to pray with the kids, guess what you do? You pray with the kids. If your spouse wants to divorce you, that's sad. It's tragic. It didn't need to happen. It's not the dream. But guess what? You still have God. Let it be said, God is with divorced people. God loves divorced people, to be sure. God hates divorce. But he loves divorced people. The first key to a lasting, healthy marriage is for both of you, or at least one of you, start there, to love God with every part of who you are. What's the second? Well, love your neighbors yourself. Uh, this is as simple as it sounds. How do you want your spouse to treat you? We all have those thoughts. How do I want my, how do I want my spouse to treat me? Treat them the same way. You want your spouse to respect you? You want to respect me. Show respect. You want to be listened to? Listen. You want to be prioritized? Make your spouse a priority. You want to be encouraged and loved? Encouraged and loved. You want your spouse to take initiative? Take initiative. It's really that simple. Now, it's no guarantee. Some spouses might not reciprocate. In fact, the more you try to love your spouse like that, the more you might push them away, and that's going to be their call. But as a person created in God's image, your spouse deserves to be loved the way you want to be. It's that simple. In fact, that's the irony of all this marriage talk. I know that marriage is uh, difficult, no barefoot walk in the park. But while it's hard, it's not that complicated. Here's the simple truth. Marriages are healthy. Marriages last when two people love God together and love each other in the way they want to be loved. That will make your marriage last. When two people love God together and love each other the way they want to be loved. For the record, this is how God loves us. He loves us with every part of who he is, and he loves us the way he wants to be loved, with sacrifice and devotion. We see this in the cross. We see it in Jesus' death for us on the cross, and we see it in communion. We take communion on the third week of every month here at Rooftop. In our understanding, communion, it's a symbolic reenactment of who we are as God's children, his family, gathered around the feast of his grace because of the loving sacrifice of Jesus, his one and only son. When Jesus died on the cross, he did so as an act of love. And God knew that only by Christ's sacrifice could we be forgiven of our sins. Only by his death could we have the opportunity to live forever with him. Communion reminds us of this. When we eat from the bread, we're reminded of his body, which was broken for us. When we drink from the cup, we're reminded of his blood poured out for us. Now, wherever you're at this morning with respect to marriage and divorce, you need to know that God loves you enough to send his son to die for your sins. Maybe you just got married and the realities of two sinners being joined together haven't hit you yet. You need to know that Jesus died for your sins. Maybe you've been married before once or twice, but you made some mistakes and now you're divorced. You need to know that Jesus died for your sins. 
Maybe your marriage has fallen apart and you're not sure it's going to last. You need to know that God will always love you. He will always be with you and Jesus died for your sins. Maybe your marriage is long and healthy and you arrogantly presume that 26 years is something to boast about because you did it. You need to know that Jesus died for your sins of arrogance and pride. Maybe you're not married and after this message you have no interest in being married at all. You and the disciples. Jesus died for your sins too. Married, single, divorced. Christ died for all. And while some marriages come to an end, tragically, preventably, God's love for us never will.